the Galileo case. Does it really prove that the church was an enemy of science? What really happened in the Galileo incident? Let's look at it today on the Catholic Church Builder of Civilization. Welcome to the Catholic Church, Builder of Civilization. I'm Thomas Woods. Today we're taking on the difficult question of Galileo. Because for the past couple of episodes, I've been trying to explain that modern scholars reject the old idea that the Catholic Church was nothing but an opponent of the sciences. In fact, you would be considered uh, almost beyond help if you continued to argue that to a professional historian of science. Nobody takes that seriously anymore, believe it or not. They really don't. However, the Galileo case still occupies such a prominent place in the popular mind that it's, I think, perhaps the greatest obstacle in our paths to trying to persuade people that, in fact, the Church has not consistently been an opponent of the sciences or any such thing. So I think it's important to go into this Galileo case in, in a little more detail than we usually get. And I will say up front, as I said last time, that I'm not here to suggest that Every course of action pursued by important churchmen, and even, even in this case a pope, was wise or prudent. Uh, in fact, I think it has damaged the church's reputation tremendously. At the same time, though, in all fairness, I think it's only fair that both sides receive a fair hearing. And typically that's not what happens. What happens is Galileo is portrayed as the great hero who is irrationally put upon by ignoramuses from the Catholic Church. Well, it's time to at least hear both sides. Now, John Henry Cardinal Newman was the great 19th century convert from Anglicanism. Great many of you, I'm sure, have heard of Cardinal Newman. And he was a great historian in his own right. And he used to say that the Galileo case was, quote, the one stock argument against the church with regard to the church's relationship to science. Because he said, in effect, that this is the only argument t people typically have. And that if you say to them, what if for the sake of argument I granted you the Galileo case? Do you have anything else? What else have you got? Again, most of the time people will just kind of stand there, stare at you blankly, or run away, because that is all they have. So even if you were to grant the Galileo case, Cardinal Newman says this is the one stock argument that's always brought out. But people unjustly extrapolate from this one incident and then draw general conclusions about the church and science. It's unjust. Well, what we're going to start with is a gentleman who lived before Galileo, who was a 16th century figure. Copernicus, Nicholas Copernicus, was a Polish astronomer. Copernicus believed in general in what we would call the Ptolemaic system or system of the universe or of our, of our solar system. Uh, he had one change that he wanted to make, but let's first look at what did Ptolemy believe. Ptolemy was, was uh, an ancient astronomer, he was a Greek, and Ptolemy proposed that the way the planets were arranged was as follows, that you had the Earth at the center, and you had the Sun and the other planets orbiting the Earth. And according to the Ptolemaic system, or sometimes called the Ptolemaic Aristotelian uh, system, the planets orbited the Earth in perfect circles, and they orbited the Earth at a perfectly constant speed. He also, it was also suggested in this model that the various heavenly bodies, including the other planets and the moon, were perfect spheres. Now Copernicus took all this, just about all this, as we'll see, for granted. What he suggested, however, was that what we should do is switch a couple of these things. We should put the sun at the center and have the earth simply be one of the planets orbiting the sun. But he kept everything else. He kept the perfect, perfect spheres. He kept the perfect, uh, perfectly circular orbits and the constant speed. He kept all that. He simply said, let's put the sun at the center. This became known as the so-called heliocentric system. The system that put the Earth at the center is known as the geocentric system. 
Now, this is not a ridiculous system, by the way, the pre-Copernican one. The idea that the Earth is at the center and everything's orbiting it, let's just say, first of all, that that's not a ridiculous conclusion. It does seem to comport with common sense. We don't feel like we're moving, right? People standing on Earth, we don't feel like we're moving. And in fact, we speak of the sun rising and the sun setting. We speak in this way. So it's not a ridiculous position. And as I'll show later on in our episode today, there were actually some excellent scientific arguments in favor of the idea that in fact the earth was motionless and it was the sun that was orbiting the earth. So we'll put that to one side. And we'll also note that this system actually worked very well for observing planetary motion. It actually worked pretty well. It wouldn't have lasted for over 2,000 years or 1,500 years anyway uh, if it didn't sort of work. It does sort of work. Now, the system that Ptolemy proposed wound up getting a little more complicated over the years in order to make his system correspond to what was being seen in the sky. So it is true, he had to add things called deference and epicycles, but roughly this was his system. The Earth at the center, the planets going in constant speeds and circular orbits, and with perfect spheres. So this is the system that Copernicus is going to overturn slightly. Copernicus puts the sun at the center. Now, Copernicus died in 1543. And he, in fact, on, as he was practically on his deathbed, he got to see, he had just published his work at the urging, in fact, of cardinals. Catholic cardinals urged him to publish his work. And he dedicated his famous book to Pope Paul III when it was published in 1543. He was afraid primarily of ridicule, not by, not by theologians, but by astronomers who had very good arguments against the idea that the Earth was in motion. And as I say, we'll get to those later. But the Copernican system shared much in common with Ptolemy. It just switched the Earth and the Sun. But it was subject to no formal Catholic censure until the Galileo case in the next century. His system, his so-called heliocentric system, was taught as a legitimate theory at Jesuit universities throughout the 16th century. Nobody got in trouble for this, and so on and so forth. It was just fine. It was treated as a theory. Now, in the 17th century, early 17th century, Galileo comes along. Now, Galileo is responsible for discoveries in physics and, and, and other areas, but we're focusing on what he saw in his telescope. Because although he didn't invent the telescope, he put it to important use. Because when Galileo looked in that telescope, he was able to see things that undermined aspects of Ptolemy's system. For instance, Galileo noted that clearly there are craters in the moon. I mean, the moon is not a perfect sphere, so that spherical thing is wrong. He noted that there were moons orbiting Jupiter. This contradicts Ptolemy because here we have something orbiting something other than the Earth. These moons are orbiting Jupiter. But more than that, as Jupiter is moving in its orbit, its moons are staying with it. One of the arguments against the idea that the Earth could be moving was that if the Earth moved, it would leave the moon behind. But here's Jupiter moving, and its moons are orbiting with it. And he observed other things through his telescope as well. These things could not be reconciled with the model of Ptolemy, in which everything orbits the Earth, and so on and so forth. Now, Galileo and his work were, in fact, welcomed and celebrated by prominent churchmen. For instance, in late 1610, Father Christopher Clavius wrote to tell Galileo that his fellow Jesuit astronomers had confirmed the discoveries that Galileo had made through his telescope. Galileo was greeted with enthusiasm in Rome in 1611. There was a day of lectures given in his honor. He wrote... I have been received and shown favor by many illustrious cardinals, prelates, and princes of this city. He enjoyed a long audience with Pope Paul V and enjoyed a day of activities in his honor at the Jesuits' Roman College. In 1612, for the first time in print, Galileo said that he favored the Copernican system, at least the part about the sun being in the center. He believed in the heliocentric system. Well, this did not get him in trouble. In fact, in this particular writing, one of the many enthusiastic letters of congratulation he got came from the future Pope Urban the Fifth. Uh, pardon me, Urban the Eighth, who in fact was the was the Pope who, as we'll see, later got Galileo in some trouble. But in 1612, there was no trouble at all with what Galileo said, and yet it's the same thing. So what's the what's going on here? Well, again, the church is arguing that the Copernican model is okay as a theoretical model, but it hasn't yet been proven to be the literal truth. 
Galileo.